So Jesse James West and Jeff Nippard decided to bust every myth in 24 hours. Fasted cardio, BCAAs, ice baths, and they tried to fact check 50 things in one day. Ambitious? Yes. Accurate? Maybe not. Because when you rush through 50 myths in a montage, you skip the nuance. And the nuance is where science actually lives. So let's go myth by myth and see which ones hold up and where the truth gets lost in translation. Starting with the fasted cardio myth. Fasted cardio burns more calories. I'm gonna go for five minutes and see how many calories I burn, and we're gonna see if it's more than usual. You're just gonna feel it. Yep. I mean, think about it. Like, a lot of bodybuilders do fast cardio. Like, I wanna have hope for it and saying that it, that it works and it burns more calories. But in reality, if your body is moving, a certain amount, I feel like you kind of just burn the same amount of calories. Okay, are you ready for this? Fasted cardio does burn more fat, but it doesn't matter because if you burn more fat during the cardio session, your body will compensate by burning less fat throughout the rest of the day. So it doesn't matter. Wow. So the myth is still busted. And there are long-term studies that compare groups doing fasted cardio versus groups doing fed cardio. And over a long time frame, it doesn't make a difference in fat loss. Because apparently it burns more fat. And Jeff admits that it technically does. But it doesn't matter long-term. And people hear that and think, so it's useless. But the reality isn't black and white. And it's true. Fed versus fasted cardio doesn't change fat loss if energy balance is the same. But fasted cardio can improve other things like metabolic flexibility, your body's ability to switch between carbs and fat efficiently. And psychologically, it can improve adherence for people who like morning training. So it's not a fat loss hack, but it's still a useful tool if it helps you train consistently. So Fasted cardio doesn't make you burn more fat, it, but it can make you burn fat more often if it helps you stick to the plan. And speaking of calories, that's where this next myth gets interesting. Part of me wants to say it's true, but I also know like it's not. In terms of carb v carb, carb has sugar, Carb also, also has, has sugar. sugar. I, I think, think it's generally, generally going to do the same damage, but there's nutrients in this, food dye in this. So, so they're not equal in terms of health, but in terms of calories, they are equal. Like, like this, this is this is 110 calories of Sour Patch, 110 calorie apple. It is equal. I think I might need to phone a friend. Jeff, Jeff, your instinct was completely right. I think what was tripping you up is you're thinking about the energy measurement. And in that sense, it is true. Calories are equal. All that calorie is, is a unit of measurement. The same as pounds is a unit of mass. When it comes to weight loss, they would actually be the same. Your body responds to calories in versus calories out. If you eat in a caloric diet. So they're comparing Sour Patch Kids versus an apple and saying that calories are equal but not equally healthy. And that's partially true, but it undersells why what you eat affects how your body uses energy. A calorie is a unit of energy but foods differ in thermic effects, satiety, and nutrient density. Protein burns around about 30% of its calories just by being digested. Carbs is around five to 10, and fats is negligible. That means that 100 calories of chicken is not the same 100 calories of candy. So when you look at net energy and net hunger, it's gonna be different. Also, insulin and blood glucose responses influence energy partitioning, so how calories are stored or spent. So stable blood sugars improve fullness and energy and decision-making for adherence. So technically, yes, a calorie is a calorie, but your metabolism, your hunger, and your discipline do not treat them equally. Now let's talk about something every lifter argues over, training to failure. What's your opinion on this one? This is going to reveal if you're more bro or more scientist. Oh man! Training to failure builds more muscle. Ooh! I'm going to take a set to failure and go way beyond failure right now. And I think that's going to cue something in my brain for an answer, okay? Come on! Not failure. This is the Dorian Yates pullover. I want real failure. That's got to build more muscle. So is it a myth or not? It's a, it's a myth. <laughs> 
<laughs> Training failure does not build more muscle. The best research shows that as long as you're one to two reps shy of failure, you see equivalent hypertrophy as if you go all the way to failure. Training each muscle once a week. Jeff says that you don't need to go to failure to grow. And it's true. But here's a nuance that most people miss. Schoenfeld in 2019 showed that hypertrophy is maximized within one to two reps in reserve. Not necessarily failure, but failure has its place. Particularly for smaller muscle groups like arms and calves or isolation works where recovery cost is low. Training to failure also trains mental, the mental side of it. Learning what true effort, the key is where you do it. Like isolation, yes, heavy compounds, maybe not. The problem we've got with training to failure is that no one knows what failure is. No one knows what one to two reps is because as soon as the muscles start burning, they'll just give up. So training to failure is not training to failure over what you think it is. You need to go beyond failure to then understand maybe I've taken a step back, this might be failure. And then how do you recognize those one to two reps in reserve? So, while well, yes, the literature says one to two reps in reserve is ideal, realistically, to get to that one to two reps, you're going to need to have the mental willingness to go beyond failure. And like they say, if you shoot for the stars, you might hit the moon. And that's just because people train like pussies, especially Jeff. The audacity to start to say that training to failure is not necessary and wants two reps in reserve from someone that used to promote heavy volume training is pretty ridiculous. But let's tie that back into another myth that they busted, the eight to 12 rep rule. Six to 12 reps means you'll gain more muscle. The classic answer of hypertrophy is gain. And hypertrophy is gonna happen somewhere around eight reps to 12. I know you believe this. I do. I'm gonna burst your bubble right now. I just want you to guess how wide studies have found the hypertrophy rep range actually is. Let's say four to 50. It's actually three to 50. So if you go below three reps, it's really, really hard to train with enough volume. If you go above 50 reps, your cardiovascular system becomes the limiting factor and it's really hard to take the muscle to true failure. But Anywhere between three and 50 reps, you can build roughly equal muscle mass. Busted, busted. So they're revealing that you can build muscle anywhere between three and 50 reps if you train near failure. They're right, but that range is wider than what was previous. But they gloss over why this matters in programming. So Schoenfeld showed equal muscle growth across heavy and light loads, but stimulus to fatigue ratio changes. Lower reps build more neural efficiency and higher reps build more local endurance. That means that you can use rep ranges strategically. So if you want three to, like we'll call it five instead of three, but five to eight reps is mechanical tension and strength focused. Eight to 15 is a balance of tension and fatigue. So hypertrophy and metabolic stress is endurance and, and maybe and then 15 to 30 is more metabolic stress. So mixing up those rep ranges gives you a complete muscle stimulus and not just one outcome. And to be honest, it's what works best for you. Because I used to train as heavy as I could between five to eight reps and then hurt myself. And realistically, if you're gonna train that heavy on those lower rep ranges, you probably, you, you're more likely to be injured. So just be aware of that as well. Talking about injury, let's talk about recovery and why ice baths feel, depending on who you are and how weird you are, feel great, but they might ruin your gains. Ice baths help you recover faster and build more muscle. Is it cold? Yes. You're from Canada, Canada bro. bro, this is nothing to you. Oh, I hate this, but it's like good for you. Do you have a scientific citation for the plane? I have been taking ice baths for a while. It helps my mental state, it gives me a lot of dopamine. I'm gonna say that ice baths are great for you. I will say this, I think it's impressive. Listen, I've never done one, so I can't speak from experience about how it feels. You wanna get in? 
Come, come on, on, come on, get in here, Jeff. Oh, that's really cold, bro. You're an animal for this. Is it better before or after your workout? I personally don't think it's necessary at either time. If you find that it helps you with like mental clarity, performance, knock yourself out. So it's a myth. If you look at the studies, there does seem to be a, a significant negative effect to prolonged cold exposure. Hurry up, Jeff, I'm freezing! It's true that they probably have a slight positive benefit for recovery and reducing soreness. It's a myth that they're good for muscle growth. <laughs> The Which one? They claim ice baths help recovery, but maybe not muscle growth. The help recovery feels faster, but it's not the same as being faster. So studies in 2015 showed that cold water immersion after lifting suppressed mTOR signaling, the same pathway responsible for muscle growth. However, timing matters. So cold exposure away from training, like in the morning if you train in the afternoon, and not directly after you lift can improve the, the mitochondrial biogenesis, stress, resilience, and dopamine regulation. So ice baths are great for a mental reset, but not post training recovery. So use cold for your head, not your hypertrophy. And now the myth that every parent still believes, and that is lifting weights actually stunts your growth. Lifting weights stunts your growth. I think we know the answer to that one. I'm done with your game. No, I just want to quickly say, like, just because a lot of people do think that weightlifting stunts your growth, but that actually is a myth. So I'm just short because my parents. Hey, you're not allowed to complain about being short, by the way. Because you're shorter than me? Yeah! You're not in the club, bro. You're out. You're not. No pain! They both call it a myth and they are right, but here's what they're missing. Lifting early doesn't just avoid harm. It does provide unique advantages for kids. And there's two studies, one from 2009, one from 2014, show that resistance training improves bone mineral density, motor coordination and confidence, which is the most important thing for kids. Youth strength training also reduces injury risk later in sport by teaching the movement patterns early because before puberty changes leverage and hormones. So no, lifting doesn't stunt your growth. It builds the foundation for everything that comes after. And this brings us to the bigger issue, what happens when you speed run science? Asking a question and answering it straight away just takes away everything. There's 50 myths in this video and each one gets about 30 seconds. To be fair, they got most of it right, but the TikTok attention span kills the nuance. And that's where good info turns into half truths. So science isn't binary, it's conditional. The answer is almost always, it depends. Fasted cardio isn't magic, but it could be useful. Calories are equal, but not in effect. Failure training works in context and you need to know what your failure is. High reps cause muscle growth. You can suffer through them. And cold therapy might help your brain but not your biceps. Science doesn't live in viral sound bites, it lives in the boring details. And understanding those boring details is what's gonna make you more educated and eventually get to where you want to go with this fitness game. So, train smarter, but question everything. And if you want to know what actually works in sound bites, but stuff you can actually read that's backed up, first link in the description, 21 ways, 21 days, and you'll understand everything you need to know about fitness. See you in the next one.